So, uh, I'll remind you that the exam is a week from today. It's here. Um, I put on the web page somewhere here link to stuff. There's things about the exam. This is terrible. This is my office. Okay. Anyway, and then there's uh, there is the exam I gave in 2010 when I taught, taught this class. And the exam, the exam Professor Anderson gave in 2011. Yes. For this class, how uh, would you come A? Is overnight is A or you curve? Well, okay. So let's look at this exam for a minute. Over 90 is a meaningless concept because they add up to 74. So it's hard to get over 90 if it's a really good. Yes, so over 90 is an A. <laughs> Not percent. No. It depends on how hard the exam is. So, so this particular exam was pretty easy, I thought. So maybe somewhere around, I don't remember. I would guess somewhere between 60 and 74 is an A or an A minus. Uh, basically, if you get you get either all all of the questions right except for one, then you probably get an A or an A minus. Or if you get most of the questions mostly right, you get an A or an A minus. But it depends on how hard the exam is. So if I write a hard exam, it could be that 50% and up is an A. So usually I don't write an exam that is that hard. Generally, I try to write an exam, although this one I was Let's, I, it was too easy. I try to write an exam where nobody will get a perfect score. Because if I write an exam where several people get a perfect score, the exam wasn't hard enough because those people were not challenged. Usually I try and write one problem that is difficult and some problems that are easy and some problems that are in the middle. How do you count like 10% students or A or I think this is the standard for A? I look at the exam and I decide how hard it is. Okay. And generally that works out that maybe 10 or 15% of the students get an A, but sometimes it works out that only one per student gets an A, and sometimes it works out that 60% of the students get an A. Okay, I think I got it. Got it. Yeah. So I don't have rigid criteria that 90% and up is an A, nor that only 10% of the students get an A. If you know the material well, you get an A. If you know the material badly, you do not. <laughs> um, generally in this class, most of the people that make it to the end of the class pass, but not always. <laughs> get it C or better. Do a lot of people usually drop out? Yeah. So last time I taught this class, uh, I had about this enrollment at about this time in the semester, and at the end of the move down day, date, I mean, a few people did the PNC business, but I would say like five or six people decided this was not really for them, which is fine. Okay, so there's that. Um, what? What? No, but you can. <laughs> so if you have questions, so I will not put up the, the answers until probably Monday, maybe before class, maybe after class. I'd like you to try it, see what you think. Um, what else? I can talk about it a little bit on Monday. I don't want to spend Monday's class doing the sample exams. I'd like you to do that, but if you have questions that you see from it, then ask. Um, yeah, so what I wanted to do, where is the rest of this page? Oh, oh that's the exam page. Uh, so I wanted to continue roughly with where we were last time. Uh, with this. I wanted to, to continue with stuff. I guess I'll start in the middle here because I'll do some graphing east kind of stuff. Just like last time. So. Last time, we talked about tangent planes and partial derivatives and stuff like that. And I want to continue with that. 
Fy tangent. So now I'm slicing it the other way, and you can see there's a tangent line there, which moves around as I move around on the surface. Right? So. So that limit gives us the partial the other way, which is that slope, which put them together will give us a plane, a uh, tangent plane somewhere on this, will give us a plane because I have here one slope and here another slope and together they define a plane. Now I can think of this, so this this tangent line that I have here gives me a slope, which gives me a, a vector, right? I can think of this slope as giving me a vector. So I can think of this plane either in coordinates, where the coordinates are saying here that from there to there I have to, so the z value is going to be the height, but then if I move away on the plane, so I move from A to X and from Y, I mean from A to X and from B to Y, well I have to adjust. If I just move along the X plane, if I just move in a line in the X direction, then I'm going to gain, well so that's a number, let's write it this way so it's clear. I'm going to gain however much I moved in that x direction on the z. In this case, it's negative. And if I move just in the y direction, I'm going to gain whatever distance I am away from the point B adjusted by the derivative. Right? So I said this towards the end of the class. We can also, yeah? Are you moving along a fixed tangent plane? So, I'm at the point AB, which in this picture is right here. Yeah. Maybe let me tilt it a little bit more. That one's kind of flat. Let's move it. Okay. Over there. Sure. Let's move it over there. So, I'm at this point here. This flat, this point here is what Z. Here? This height is Z of AB. Yeah. Where AB is that point. Yeah. And then now I'm going to move on this plane a little bit. Okay, so you're not changing. You're not moving on the plane. You're just moving on that. I'm moving on the plane. Right. right. Which is exactly the analogy in one dimension. If I know the point here, that's A, and I have the tangent line here, I go to this height, which is F of A, and then I move some distance here to a point X, then I take this slope, so the slope is f prime of a, and I move this distance, x minus a, in that direction, so I have to adjust to get this height, what I started with, plus the slope, which in this case is negative, times however far away I moved. It's the exact analogy. It's just now I'm in a plane. And I can move in the x direction, or I can move in the y direction, or I can move some combination of both. And as long as there's a nice plane here, this will work. But this function has to be nice for there to be a nice plane there. I can also write this, I can also think of this in terms of vectors, where where I would have this vector, uh, let's make it two. So here's my point, f vector of AB, which is on the surface that I'm not drawing. And then I have a vector 
Well, in this case, this is y. So this is some slope times j. Uh, f y of a b times the j vector gives me that. And in this direction is some other vector, which is the x derivative a b. That's an i in the i direction. So that means to get to some point here on the plane, out here on the plane, I move some amount in the x direction and some amount in the y direction. So my plane can be written parametrically as my vector value function. So that's my position vector of the base point plus however much I moved in the x direction, but I have to, I want to describe the whole plane so there's some parameter t, because it's parametric. This is a vector. This whole thing is a vector. And I mean some amount this diff distance here in the y direction. We need to back this off. Okay, forget about this parametric representation because I've just embarrassed myself terribly. We'll come back to that. Otherwise, I'm going to spend the whole day figuring out what I wrote down wrong that was garbage. So let's do an example, an easy example. Let's take this, this plane here and let's just write the equation of the tangent plane to uh, minus 4 x squared plus y squared equals z at, I don't know, 1, 1. Okay? Does everyone know how to do that? Does anyone not know how to do that? I have a question. Yeah. Um, you mentioned last time that when you find a question, partial oh, this or y, we'll just treat x squared as entirely as a constant, right? And you don't Yes. Yeah? So, yes. So, can everyone do this? Does anyone need me to do this? Yes, you need me to do it. Okay. So, we need to compute the partial derivatives, evaluate them at 1, 1, and then look at the plane. So, <coughs> partial of f, let's write it in the other notation partial of f with respect to x at 1, 1. Well, let's write it this way. Um, it's going to be, so I look at this function, I think of y as a constant, and I don't like the quotient rule, so I'm actually going to think of this as minus 4x, 1 plus x squared plus y squared to the minus 1 power. So that gives me a minus 4, 1 plus x squared plus y squared to the minus 1 power plus minus 4x times this derivative will turn it into a plus. So I get a 4x, 1 plus x squared plus y squared to the minus 2 power, but then I need to multiply by the derivative of 2x, right? Because this is a constant. So when I take the derivative of this with respect to x, I'm just left with 2x. And with respect to y, I might have made a mistake. So if I made a mistake, please tell me. Again, now I'm thinking of x as a constant. So I get minus 4x, 1 plus x squared plus y squared to the minus 2 times 2y, that's right, uh, except the minus power changes that to a plus. And then I want to evaluate this at the point, so that will be minus 4 over 3 plus 4 over 9 
times 2, which is minus 12 over 9 plus 8. This should be what? 4 nines? Negative. Negative? No, positive. Right? This is 8 nines. Just that one. Oh, that's 12. Yeah, that's minus. Sorry. Minus 4 nines. And then here, Fy of 1, 1 is 4 over 3, 4 over 9 times 2, which is positive 8 nines. So that's telling me, of course, it's not at the point that I'm drawing here. At the point 1, 1, which in this picture is there, if I move in the x direction, I decrease by a factor of minus four nine. I mean, a factor of four nines. And if I move in the y direction, my slope even increases by a factor of eight nines. Overall, that plane. Oops. That plane is the plane. Z is the function at 1, 1, which I guess I didn't compute, minus 4 over 3, plus, well, it's minus, minus 4 over 9 times x minus 1. That's how far I moved in the x direction. And then here, plus 8 over 9 times y minus 1. Right? And yeah. yeah. Good enough. So now it's easy to convert this into parametric form if you want. Do you want me to do that? Alright. How about x equals 1 minus t? Or how about let's just say x equals t. Uh, and y equals t, s, and z is, well, minus 4 thirds, minus, let's make x minus 1 t, so that's plus 1, plus 1, then it's easier, 4 ninths t, plus 8 ninths s. Right? It's the same thing. What? Well, okay, so, or uh, t plus 1, s plus 1, minus 4 thirds, minus 4 ninths, t plus 8 ninths, s. Or, T plus 1, I plus S plus 1, J minus that junk, so plus minus 4, that's plus thirds plus, no it isn't, <coughs> minus 4 ninths plus 8, T, 8 ninths S. Okay. So, is it clear that these are all the same thing? There's nothing canonical about this t plus 1. You could choose just t here, but then this would need to be a t minus 1. Right? Just deciding where 0 is. Deciding where the origin on the plane is. The way that I put it here, the origin of the plane is right here at the center of the plane. But if I may T, if I chose a different parameterization where this, this component was, I don't know, let's call it U, then the center of the plane would be back here on the axis. Yeah? Um, before we do this, do we need to state where is the origin? No, the origin is yeah. explicitly uh, obvious here. Oh, okay. Right? The origin, I mean, this, this, the origin is 0, 0, 0. Okay. The origin is always 0, 0, 0. Yeah, no, so the thing that was screwing me up when I was trying to write it is I was thinking of the plane as sitting at the origin. The, the center of the plane as being the origin. 
that my point was 0, 0, 0. And then I was getting lost. So here, <coughs> we're, we're putting, in, in some sense, in our parameterization, t equals 0, s equals 0, is sitting over the point 1, 1, not sitting over the origin. Right? Which is sort of a more natural place for the center of the tangent plane to be is sitting right on the graph. So we have to adjust so that the coordinates are the usual coordinates. Okay. Any questions about that? You should all certainly be able to do that problem within a week or one like it. This is something I view as a mid-level, maybe easy problem. Somewhere between easy and mid-level. If you can't do this, don't expect to be able to get a C on the midterm. Well, yeah. Can't do this or other things like it. Okay. So when does this break? I said if everything's nice, this works. Well, sometimes things aren't nice. So, what? There can be more than one tangent. Well, what does that mean? If that function is sharp enough. Okay, so then there's not a tangent plane. All right. So if the graph, what's that mean? Can, can I start erasing? I don't know where. The problem with putting these things down. So if the, I, well, maybe there's one here that I can just use. Should it be a zero zero? Um, should be one with like a one over. How about we just draw that? Something like one over x squared plus y squared. That one has a problem at the origin. Uh, because it kind of blows up there. Right? So there's no tangent plane at the origin. Well, the function's not even defined at the origin. So that's kind of a problem. Um, now I could, you know, change this. Well, let me just draw it rather than figuring out one. So if I have, in, by analogy, with the one-dimensional situation, have something that comes to a peak, which looks like it would be hard to sit on. Um, maybe, so I want this to be, so maybe if I take the arctan of that, would that work? That would probably be too much. I should have, no, that was too much. Um, No, that flat. I don't like that. Sorry. Oh well. Forget that. So if I have something that comes to a point, which I didn't have one in mind at the moment, that'll be a problem. Is that the only thing that can go wrong? Okay. What else can go wrong? Have like a something like a jump discontinuity. Okay. I could certainly have. So this is bad. I could have. Something like that, right? So this is this is supposed to remind you of a surface that looks like this one, right? Looks, this way. looks like this one. Um, anything else? Well, then it's not defined. Okay, so I can have things like this. I can also have even worse things where stuff wiggles around like crazy and piles up in different ways. Um, so, so something that is important is the idea of continuity. So, so those are important ideas here. This guy is continuous, but it's not smooth. Did I 
different. No, I got it all there. I think. I don't know. Um, but there's something that can happen in two variables that doesn't happen in one variable. That is, we can maybe calculate any derivative we want, but they don't hook together nicely. Uh, I'll give you an example of that in a second. But let's just think about what continuity means. So in one variable, continuity for a function of one variable means that the limit as x goes to a of f of x is f of a. So this is not smoothness. So this guy is continuous. This guy, not so much. Uh, but in two variables, we want something similar. Let's just restrict to 1 and to 1. I want the limit as x the vector goes to a the vector of f of x to equal f of a. But here, it might depend on how you get there. Something could happen that it's OK in some directions and not OK in other directions. Like if I'm trying to get to this point, it's perfectly, well, no, not so much here. Uh, this point, no, not so much. Yeah, this point is, is perfectly fine if I come in this way. All of those always go here. But if I come in along the tear, I have a problem. So there could be bad directions. So this can have directions which are bad to come in on. And the same sort of thing can go on with, I mean, the same thing, sort of thing can go in on, um, the same sort of problem can happen with derivatives. So this is bad, this is good. In one variable, and in several variables, I still have this is bad, but I can also have that the derivatives don't hook together in a nice way. That I get a different value depending on how I come in. So let me, I'll make a picture of such a thing here. Uh, so suppose I take, what do I want? x squared minus parentheses. x squared minus y squared over x squared plus y squared. So, I don't know if you can see this, it's weird at zero. So it's basically, I mean, so there's sort of a crease along, there's a straight line, I mean if you look there, if I look at it just in the x direction, it looks fine. And if I look at it just in the y direction, it also looks fine, but they don't match up. The function in, in one direction is down here, and another direction is up here, and somehow there's a, there's a crease going on. Right? There's a crease right in here where things are weird. 
So I have a problem at 0, 0. Now, the partial derivatives of this thing are just fine. some combination, then the function does something in between. Right? If I come in along the line x equals y, I get 0. So I have all sorts of weird stuff going on here. But if you didn't notice this and you took the partial derivatives, you get a nice formula. So it's a little more careful, one has to be a little more careful. You just get zero when you take the partial derivatives at the origin. So one has to be a little more careful with these functions than in one variable. It's not obvious right away what's going on. Okay? So I just want to point out that there's some subtleties and you need to think about what's going on with these things. We will spend more time on this. So I want to point out something, though, which, so I guess I'm now done with this thing. So, so any questions on this, this kind of a surface? I mean, I can, uh, where, where's my, I can obviously do many more examples of this kind of thing, but we have finite time. Does everybody understand the, the issue here? That there's a subtle issue which I'll come back to later, but um, but but if everything's nice, then it's nice. So nice is good. Um, so no, you we were supposed to turn on. Off. <laughs> it clicks and then it doesn't go off. Yeah. Okay. And it doesn't really matter if it's two. So.
So I'm, I'm. So if it's a nice, it's, I'll say a function is nice if we have a tangent plane everywhere. I'll define what nice means in a second. So assuming it's nice, that is, we have a tangent plane. There's an important theorem called Clairaut's theorem. Which basically says, if it's nice, you have a tangent plane. Um, so f, let's say from Rn to R, is continuous at some point, let's call it a vector. And also, should I just say it in the state? Let me just say it in the case of two. And also, no. Sorry. No, I'll do it in two. <laughs> Sorry. It works in higher dimensions, but. So, and also, fx. Oh, it's two, so I can call it a b. A not f x and f y are continuous and differentiable. Well, yeah. So if the function's continuous and the partials are continuous, and I can take their derivatives, then if I take the y derivative of fx, and I take the x derivative of fy, they're the same. So, in other words, and this is part of why I can never remember which means what. So this says, for a nice function, the mixed second partials are equal. So, i.e., partial of f with respect to x and then with respect to y, so it's a second partial, is the same as the second partial of x with respect to y and then with respect to x. So the order doesn't matter. I want the second derivative, there's really three. There's the fxx, fyy, and the other one, fxy, which is the same as fyx. Um, let me do a simple example. I don't, I could do the proof, but then we wouldn't get anywhere. Let me just tell you the idea of the proof without really doing it. But first, let's do an example. Um, I don't know, x squared cosine xy. Well, there's a function. If I compute fx, this will be so this, I'm thinking of y is a constant, so that'll be 2x cosine xy plus x squared, should be minus sine xy, and I pick up a y. I think I did that right. And fy is much easier, x squared sine xy, but I pick up another x, and it's negative. If I did those right. 
Yeah. Uh, so I'm taking the derivative of this. It's a product rule. The derivative of the first is x squared times the second. Oh, okay, sorry. And then the first times the derivative of the second. And then this one doesn't need a product rule because the only y is inside the cosine. So that gives me an x cubed sine x y. So now if I take, let me write it this way just to emphasize, d dy of fx, which is also, I always forget which one goes first. I think this is f x y. I think that's the right notation. So I take the derivative of this thing, but with respect to y, this term gives me a 2xy sine xy negative. This term gives me is something messier. So the derivative of this is 2xy sine xy. Now it's minus, uh, I've lost it, 2xy sine xy minus a minus x squared y cosine xy, but I pick up another y. I think that's right. And if I take the x derivative of fy, I should get the same thing. So if I take the x derivative of this, somewhere I've lost the sign, I think. Well, let's just see. If I take the derivative of this, I get 3x squared sine xy minus x cubed cosine xy fourth plus, okay, I really screwed up somewhere. Can you do it in respect to y twice on the top? Or, I mean, with y constant on the top? I was supposed to take y derivative, wasn't I? How stupid. This is just garbage. Sorry. I'm taking the y derivative of this. So this is 2x squared cosine xy. And the y derivative of this x squared sine xy minus x squared y cosine xy squared. No. It's still not the same. Did I do it wrong? It's not y squared, it's x cubed. Yeah. So you're going to 2x squared. That's the last, that last term. Here? That, for the next left hand. Left. I don't know left. <laughs> yeah, that one. Negative 2 x squared sine x Yes. No. We're taking it in terms of y. You gotta take the y derivative. Jeez. Yeah. <laughs> Just take the x derivative. Anyway, it works. <laughs> I don't know why I can't do this. Let's try again. The y derivative of this sucker is 2x squared cosine xy. Sine. 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 And it's negative. Thank you. And then this term I probably had right. Minus x The y derivative of this is minus x squared sine xy. Plus negative. Plus negative. The derivative is still negative x squared y cosine xy, pick up another y. Pick up x. Pick up an x. And that's what, those are equal now, right? Almost. Okay, it's not my day. Let's try again. This guy, minus, I'm taking the root with respect to x minus 3x squared sine xy is this part 
And then when I take this part, I get minus x squared cosine xy with respect to x. So I get another y. I get minus x cubed. It's x cubed. Now. X cubed. Yeah, because it's cubed. There. They match now. Good. I get a C minus on the test. So. Uh, okay, so why does Clairaut's theorem work? So you can read the proof in the book, but it basically just comes down to the mean value theorem twice. So you look at, so the mean value theorem says that, the mean value theorem, if you remember, says that if I have some function and I look at its, the slope at a tangent point, and I take some integral around it. I'm sorry. Try it again. I take a, a function of one variable and I connect two dots on it. But somewhere in between, there's a point where the tangent line is parallel. And so what you do is you cleverly use this fact that you look at an appropriate function which says that I'm going to take my function of two variables, which I can't really draw. Here's my function of two variables. And I'm going to go this way to get a tangent plane. And then I'm going to move that way to get the second derivative. And everything is going to work out. So I take the, use the mean value theorem for x this way, and then y that way. And that's the same as doing y first and then x. Another way to think about this geometrically is this is saying the rate of change of the tangent plane doesn't matter if you go like this and like this than if you go like this and like this. If I move around, I mean, of course, I took the video off. If I move around on the surface and I want to go, here's my surface, I'm at this point, here's a tangent plane. And I want to get to this point here with a different tangent plane. I can move my tangent plane this way and then this way. And the way in which the tangent plane moves is the same as if I move this way and then this way. So the, the net rate of change, which is how the mixed partial is measuring how the tangent plane moves, is the same if I go by two different paths, as long as my function is nice. All right, so you can read that proof if you want. It's just a bunch of algebra calculus. Let me skip that. Um, OK, let me mention some other sort of standard functions of more than one variable. First, let me remind you quadratic functions, well not quadratic functions, conic sections. So in one variable, I have ellipses, parabola, and hyperbola. So these are the quadratic quadratics in x and y, and I don't have a lot of choices. So I get a parabola, like this. And again, I'm just going to move everything to the origin. And the form of a parabola is y equals ax squared. This one you should be very familiar with. I could have a circle, or more generally, an ellipse. Let me just throw on the lips. I really should make that be a B. Let's call it B. So that's supposed to be an ellipse. It's a little bit off. So this is of the form x squared plus y squared is 1. And A and B measure the directions in each. So if A equals B, we get a circle. <laughs> so 
So A and B are the semi-major and semi-minor axes. And then we can have a hyperbola We draw it this way, which looks like x squared over a squared minus y squared over b squared equals 1. Right? So this should not be new to you guys. Is this new to anybody? You won't admit it because I said it should be. Okay, so those are the, the sort of the simple, the most simple degree 2 functions where I'm allowing for both x and y to be degree 2. And if we move to functions where we have an x, a y, and a z, really we have the same things, but we can put them together in different ways. So instead of being called conic sections, by the way, these are called conics. Probably you know, I just lost here with the eraser. This group only needs two erasers. These things are called conics because if you take a cone and you slice it, if I slice it with a plane, this way I can get an ellipse. Or if the, if the cone is round, I might get a circle. If I slice it this way, I'll get a hyperbola. That's supposed to. Anyway, depending on how I slice it, if I slice it parallel to this, but over here, I get a parabola. And if I slice it a little tilted, I can get a hyperbola. So slicing this cone in three different ways, gives me, you can't see what I'm doing. Depending on how I tilt this slice, I get one of these three things. They're called conic sections because they're sections of a cone. Um, in R3, the analog is called a quadric surface. Um, since I started with the circle there, did I start with the parabola there? I guess I started with the parabola, so we can have a paraboloid. Which we've already looked at, it looks something like, let me Well, all right, so my A's and B's don't match. But anyway, I get something like that. This gives me either that, or I could also have something that's sort of a down-facing parabola one way and an up-facing parabola the other way. So all of the slices in one direction are parabolas which open downward and all the slices in the other direction are parabolas which open upward. Do you, do you see this surface? It, okay, it's, a saddle. it's a saddle surface. So this is actually called an elliptic Paraboloid, and this is called a hyperbolic <coughs> paraboloid, but most normal people call it saddle surface. Um, and for some reason, I switched my notation. Let me put my notation to match. So this guy has a minus sign. So the difference here, both terms are positive. Z equals the sum of two positive squares. It gives me paraboloid like this, or both the same sign down. Uh, and this guy gives me, well, since one is positive and one is negative, they open in opposite directions. 
So the slices here are parabola, which either open down or open up, depending on which way I'm slicing. But we have other variations there too. So we can have something, so this is a slice this way is an ellipse, and a slice that way is a parabola. This one, a slice this way is a parabola, and a slice that way is a parabola. Okay, what am I doing? This one is a parabola either way, and the cross section here are ellipses. It's not obvious that the cross sections here are straight lines, but they are. The level curves are X's. Um, another option is we can have an ellipsoid. So that will be, again, looking like this. If 
I take that guy, I get the thing in between, which is a cone. It's an elliptical cone. Cross sections are ellipses. If A equals B, if A equals B, everything here is a, has a circular cross section. But if A is the difference, we get a we get an elliptical cross section. Okay, so we get these combinations of those things in higher dimensions. I have a few minutes left. Okay, good. So, yeah, I mean, these are sort of just like these conic sections are things that you should easily recognize when you see an equation like that. These are the higher dimensional analogs that are sort of good examples to keep in mind. Um, Wait, are these also sections of 4D objects? Sure. So if you think about it... In the same way that, the, that uh, conic sections are all slices of a thing. Yeah, but they're cut by a three-dimensional slice. So just, just think about these guys. These guys all fit together in a very nice way. Pick an A, pick a B, and let K move. Then you can envision this thing pinching down and splitting apart. You can make a little movie of that. But you can think of these as stacked together where K is a fourth dimension. So I have an object, a three-dimensional space, that sits inside a fourth dimension where these slices are the three are the two-dimensional surfaces that cut up the three-dimensional space. In the same way for a, a hyperbola comes to be Right. So these are slices, and you can move them around and think of them as the same. You can do the same thing with the ellipses and the, you know. These things can evolve one into the other, which you can think of as slight slicing of a higher dimensional object. Um, okay, so we have just a few minutes left. But I have yet another topic to cover that I didn't even mention. So now I want to sort of come back to the analog that we had with more than one variable. Now I want more than one variable in and more than one variable out. But let's just let's just think about, let's take an example. Let's take a function here where I'm going to put in two numbers and I'm going to get out three numbers. So for example, um, let's just do this one, okay, f of u, v, so I'll write it this way because it's shorter to write, is, it is, what do I want there, cosine, oh, I'll write it this way, it doesn't matter, u cosine v, u sine v, What does that describe? Huh? Well, it's like a spiral, but it's not really a spiral. It's like a parking ramp. Um, so, I mean, if you just think about this, let's just fix one of the variables. So let's think of, say, u being a constant. Let's just make it be one for a minute. Then the v variable is the only thing that matters. So f of one v is cosine v sine v v, which we've already seen gives us a helix like this. Right? It spirals around and goes up, and it starts at when v is 1, it starts at 1, sorry, when v is 0, it starts at 1, 0, 0. And then it goes up like this. 
Now if I move over a little bit, let's instead of u equals 1, u equals a. I'm going to pick up an a here and a here. All that does is move out a little bit. So I get another spiral up here, a bigger spiral. And if I move A back and forth, I can think of this as giving me something like a ramp going up. So that is F really takes. Now let's see, which have I fixed? I fixed the x value. Something like that to something like that. So it gives me a ramp. Going up and looping around like that. And of course, I just picked A positive. I picked here A between 1 and 2, say. But it gives me a thing like that. And if we look at the other dimension, let me just do that in red, say. If I, instead of fixing A, let's, I mean, instead of fixing U, let's fix V. This will just give me straight lines like this that keep spinning around because V is a constant, so I get U, U, constant. So the other direction is just lines of a constant height. The height is this value moving around. So this, this idea that you see by this example is the idea of a parametric surface. All it is is a bunch of parametric lines, parametric curves, fit together in a nice way to sweep out a surface. Now, in the special case where we're taking two dimensions into three dimensions, it's easy to think of these in as surfaces. But it works the same way Let's, let's consider if we're taking, say, R2 into R2. Now I can't draw the picture because the picture lives in four dimensions. But I can think of F of some input square is maybe some, maybe I should call it G here because it's not that. Is some output square. This is in the plane. In the plane. <coughs> I put some. Um, yeah. For for things that go from R N to R N, can you just visualize it as a vector field instead? We didn't talk about vector fields, but sure. <laughs> so I can also view this as a vector field, <laughs> but we're not getting the vector fields until like sometime in November. Okay. <laughs> But yes, I can think of this as a vector field, but I can, it's also useful to think of this as a transformation of a piece of Rn into another piece of Rn. Now the vector field is just the difference between this point and its image. So I can think of it as a vector field. But at this point, I don't want to think of it as a vector field. I want to think of it as moving stuff around. Which is the same, right? When you move stuff around, you either have what you get after you move it, or you have the directions for moving. So this is the analogy of the vector field. All right? So I want to talk about calculus of this stuff a little bit on Monday, taking derivatives and so on. I mean, 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 I mean,